I'll signal you when we're live. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please take your seats about to start? I want to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones. We don't want to in the The uh, uh, Q&A portion, uh, please wait for the microphone. We'd like to record your question. If you're speaking without the microphone, we can't uh, get it on our webcast. So we appreciate your, your indulgence that way. And uh, again, welcome. And uh, thank you for coming. Good morning, everyone. So I like call and response. So it's a good, a good way to start at 11 a.m. Welcome to the West Virginia University College of Law Elenfeld Lecture. It's a great privilege for me to be here today and to welcome all of you um, to the lecture to hear Professor David Luban. I'd also like to say that this lecture is special not only because of the generosity of the Elenfeld family, um, and, but also because this is the second lecture in which we have reached across disciplines to work with the philosophy department in offering um, this joint lecture, and we're very pleased to have the opportunity to do that. As all of you know, interdisciplinary studies is the wave of the future, and it enriches us all, and so it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, on the behalf of the College of Law, I would like to welcome you to the 18th annual Charles Elenfeld Lecture. It's a lecture series devoted to the examination of ethics and public service. These lectures are made possible by a generous bequest in Charles L. Elenfeld's will. Charles L. Elenfeld was a graduate of the College of Law in 1933. He hailed from Wheeling. He was a man of amazing integrity and accomplishment. And thanks to his gift to our College of Law, we're able to bring to campus outstanding speakers like Professor Luban um, to remind us all of Mr. Elenfeld's personalized and pers personified ethical commitment to public service. As I said, Elenfeld was a graduate of the class of 1933. He was a very prominent West Virginian. He practiced law for over half a century, served as president of the Ohio County Bar, was a devoted public servant who distinguished himself as a thoughtful, diligent, and eminently ethical lawyer. When um, he has been described to me, I've always felt that this was a person that I wanted to know personally. And one of the things that I think is so amazing about his legacy in giving us this lecture series that will last in perpetuity is that once a year we all get to come together and remember a man who committed his life and his career not only to public service, but to ethics in public service. And that's a great legacy for us. Mr. Elenfeld chose the um, electoral process. He held elected office. Um, he used his power in elected office to improve his community, the lives of his fe fellow citizens, and his life continues to be an inspiration to us all. Um, we're very fortunate today um, that he leaves us not only the legacy of this amazing lecture series, but he also leaves us the legacy of his own son, who is here today, Mr. Bill Elenfeld. We thank you very much for being here, and please stand. And that legacy continues um, because generally um, Mr. Elenfeld, who was a 1965 graduate, is accompanied by his son, who was a 1997 graduate, and now I know there is a grandchild, maybe two now? Three, okay, this multiplying, who we all expect will come to the College of Law and continue the Elenfeld le um, uh, legacy and lecture series. So I want to welcome you all here today. I think it's a, a wonderful moment each year for all of us to remember in our legal careers, in our profession, our incredible privilege at being lawyers, but our, also our responsibility to serve as public servants, to serve the profession, and to serve it ethically. 
It's my privilege to introduce this lecture series, um, but at first I like to introduce uh, the person who's going to introduce our speaker, and that is Professor Mark Leclerc, who is a professor in the philosophy department, and also, again, keeping our tradition of cross-disciplinary work, he's an adjunct in community medicine, um, where public service and ethics matter um, as much as it does in the law. So thank you very much for being here this morning, and please welcome Mark, Professor Mark LeClaire. Thank you, Dean McCollin. Uh, I, I shared uh, Dean McCollin's uh, real delight in being able to coordinate uh, these two major events on campus, annual events, that are devoted to uh, cross-fertilization of, of disciplines. Uh, the Ehlenfeld Lecture and Applied Ethics Day. Uh, one of the goals of Applied Ethics Day is to promote this kind of cross-fertilization, and this is an ample demonstration that it's, uh, it, it's achieving its goals, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, for their valuable assistance and support, uh, Dean McConnell of the Law School, uh, Professor Charles DeSalvo, also of the Law School, uh, Dean Rudy Almasi, the uh, interim dean of arts and sciences. Uh, for those of you who are here, you know that uh, uh, in the law, at least, uh, three times can mean um, can mean a life sentence. And this is now Dean Almasi's third term as interim dean. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Sharon Ryan, who's the chairman of the philosophy department at WVU. Uh, one of the other goals of uh, Applied Ethics Day, in addition to the cross-fertilization of disciplines, uh, is to demonstrate um, that philosophy can uh, help identify, uh, analyze, and uh, may I even say sometimes answer uh, very important and very pressing questions uh, over a wide range of ethical issues. And in past years, Applied Ethics Day has examined ethical issues related to engineering, journalism, business, the environment, uh, and uh, human genetics. Uh, so this is a, now a long tradition of trying to do some interdisciplinary cross-fertilization. Now, um, if, if there is a platonic form of the ideal Applied Ethics Day speaker, uh, it would be personified by Professor Lubin. Uh, he is a, he earned a PhD in philosophy from Yale. He's a professor of law at Georgetown University. Uh, he's an internationally recognized scholar uh, where he's written on the uh, intersections of law, philosophy, and ethics. Um, and although he doesn't have a law degree, he's not a uh, licensed lawyer, he actually uh, has engaged in some legal defense work, and uh, he has helped with defense uh, at the um, Georgetown Asylum Clinic. Uh, and I'm not sure whether Lou Dobbs has an uh, enemies list, but uh, if he does, I'm sure Professor Luban is pretty high on the list because he has helped uh, with the defense of a number of asylum seekers in the United States. Uh, which demonstrates that in addition to uh, affecting minds, philosophy and philosophers can affect uh, more than just minds, also people's rights and bodies. Uh, Professor Luban has published uh, numerous books and articles. His most recent book is Legal Ethics and Human Dignity, uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, he's written on legal ethics, legal theory, international criminal law, just war theory, and the topic that he's going to be talking about today, uh, U.S. torture policy, although U.S. doesn't torture, but whatever it is that they do, he'll be speaking about that. Uh, Professor Luban has, uh, uh, has won an, a number of, received a number of uh, prestigious visiting appointments. Uh, he has had visiting appointments at the schools of law at Stanford, Yale, and uh, Harvard. Uh, he's had visiting appointments in philosophy at Dartmouth and the University of Melbourne, and he has also won numerous awards. I'll just mention some of them. Uh, he was a Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars uh, Fellow. He had a Guggenheim Fellowship, um, and he was uh, uh, recently awarded a teaching um, award at, at Georgetown. 
And I'm sure we'll all uh, see after his talk why he uh, won that award at Georgetown. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Lubin. Thanks, Mark. That's, um, I'm embarrassed to hear the introduction because, you know, of course, now if I mess up royally, then you say, why did this guy win a teaching award? I mean, what, were, what Kool-Aid were the Georgetown students drinking that year? Uh, also, everybody who's in the ethics class have now heard that I engage in the unauthorized practice of law. Um, <laughs> and uh, I should explain two things that I partner with a real immigration lawyer. And uh, immigration court is one of the few contexts in which uh, it's, it's uh, permitted to represent clients uh, without a, a law degree. Uh, so I, I'm not starting off with a violation. Um, and I, I, I'd really like to, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Bill and uh, the Elenfeld family and uh, the dean and uh, Sharon from the philosophy department. I was here in 2004 for philosophy day and had a wonderful time and was just delighted to be back here. Now, if you are like my students at Georgetown, this is a time of year in which you're not reading the newspapers that often. Uh, exams are coming. Uh, stress is pouring on. You barely have time to keep up with friends and uh, uh, going through the headlines on obscure international stories is not something that's your highest priority. So some of you may have seen this and some may not. Uh, a very curious story this past weekend about how a prosecutor in Spain is seeking an indictment against a half a dozen prominent former U.S. government lawyers, including the former Attorney General of the United States, uh, Alberto Gonzalez, and uh, uh, the former uh, General Counsel of the Defense Department, and is, um, is seeking an indictment for uh, um, complicity in torture. Now, this is pretty astonishing, and of course the first question that comes up is, Spain? What why is this their business? And uh, in that, there are complicated international law questions, but there's also, uh, which I don't want to talk about today, there's also a very simple answer. One of the high-value detainees that was tortured was a Spanish national. And uh, that's where Spain gets the jurisdictional hook to seek this. Now, that, that was not the only major story of the week. I mean, you might have read it and said, what's going on, filed it away. Um, there was another story that came out within the last week, and that was uh, by a journalist named Mark Danner, who did a long piece in the New York Review of Books. Mark Danner had somehow gotten a hold of a confidential report by the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is, as you know, an organization in Geneva. The Red Cross has a deal with every country in the world. Um, you let us visit prisoners in your armed conflicts and interview them to see, to see whether they are being mistreated in any way, and we will keep the report confidential from the general public. If they're being mistreated, we'll make a confidential report to the government. Somehow, Mark Danner got a hold of the Committee on the Red Cross's report from uh, the high-value detainees, who had, some of whom had been in Guantanamo all along. Some had been in the various CIA secret prisons in Thailand and Romania and Poland, uh, but were now in Guantanamo. And uh, they had been allowed to interview them. Mark Danner got a hold of the report. And uh, I'm sure that uh, they are, you know, to use the technical expression, having a cow about this in Geneva, because this really is a serious compromise of the Red Cross mission. But uh, what it revealed was that, indeed, these men have been tortured. So how do we know this? It's only their testimony. Well, the key to understanding the report is that each of them was interviewed before they had had a chance to talk with the others and settle on a story and get the story straight. And each of them reported that the identical techniques were used on them. So we, do we know that they're telling the truth? Well, it would just be an astounding coincidence if they were all telling the same lie. So briefly, what, what were the techniques? They involved a number of things. There were some variations from detainee to detainee. But the main ones were uh, weeks on end of nudity combined with uh, sleep deprivation. Um, combined with uh, loud 
continuous 24-hour-a-day music, except that sometimes the music would be taken off and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it was just hissing and crackling coming from the loudspeaker. No solid food. Uh, they were just fed in sure, you know, which is this canned stuff that's used for people who can't eat solid food for weeks on end, shackled in a stress position for weeks on end. So one of them was shackled to a chair for three weeks and fed nothing but ensure. Um, it was let you know, after he was let up, um, his uh, backside was completely covered with uh, blisters. Um, others were shackled from uh, the ceiling by their arms for a couple of weeks on end. There were uh, a couple of other techniques. The most famous, of course, is waterboarding, which is uh, uh, partial drowning. The person has water poured uh, over a cloth over their face uh, with their head lower and uh, the water goes into the lungs and when it is done right then the, the, this is interrupted before they drown. Uh, it's sometimes described in the media as simulated drowning but it's not that. Uh, the, the guy who actually does the waterboarding in training of our own special forces, has waterboarded hundreds of people and been waterboarded himself. Said, so, no, it's, a, it's an incomplete drowning, and you actually do get two or three pints of water out of your lungs uh, after you have been waterboarded. Uh, so uh, the, the only new technique that nobody knew about before was uh, something in which uh, a... Uh, a plastic collar, or in one case, a towel is wrapped around the detainee's neck, and it's used to slam him repeatedly against wall. Uh, wall. All of them uh, said that they were beaten, and uh, all of them were also repeatedly given the cold cell treatment. So you're naked, hosed down, and put in a cell for eight or ten hours at 50 degrees. Uh, and then repeatedly had cold water poured on them. And uh, one of the things that the ICRC report said, it, it had little trouble concluding that this was, in fact, torture, um, that it met the legal definition of torture, is that uh, um, when the techniques are piled one on top of the other in rapid succession, they accumulate. And if there was ever any doubt that any one of the techniques, you know, like look, um, being listen, forced to listen to ACDC 24 hours a day, full volume, that's some people's idea of a good time. Right? Um, it wasn't for the detainees, but it, when it's combined with all of these other things, plus, of course, the constant background, what are they going to do to me next? Are they going to kill me next? Uh, the ICRC, the Red Cross, had little trouble concluding that this was torture, and they had cor corroboration from an unexpected source. That's uh, Susan Crawford, who was a Bush administration official, um, a, a very conservative person who was completely on board with the Bush administration and was the head of military commissions who, back in January, said uh, that she, too, has concluded that the accumulation of all of these techniques amounted to torture and used that as a reason for saying there's one of these guys who is a genuine bad guy, but we're not going to put him on trial because of the torture that he was subjected to. Now, these aren't the only cases we know about. Uh, back uh, uh, in 2005, uh, FBI agents who were at Guantanamo reported to their superiors that they were seeing strange goings on at Guantanamo uh, amounting to torture and uh, uh, the army launched an investigation. Part of that investigation is confidential, part is public and it focused uh, uh, on the interrogation of uh, one detainee he identified in the report as number 63. He's now known to be a guy named Mohammed al Qatani. Uh, and there's a very, if you Google Schmidt report, don't do it now, um, Google Schmidt report, you can come up with the 35-page report that talks about the techniques, which included, along with other things, a lot of uh, sexual humiliation, some of which later surfaced in the Abu Ghraib photos as having been done at Abu Ghraib. And that's another piece of the story that I hope I can touch on for a moment today. Uh, one of the keys about the interrogation of Al-Qahtani was that he was interrogated 28, 20 hours a day for 48 days out of 54, um, with an interruption when his heart rate plunged and he was hospitalized. So really intense sleep deprivation. Uh, but uh, also these other sexual humiliations, you know, having a, a uh, being dressed in a bra, having a thong put over his head, being told that his mother and sister were whores, uh, um, 
being led around by a dog leash and uh, forced to perform dog tricks, being threatened with a military working dog. Now, what was going on? Well, you have to, I mean, let's, let, let's go back to the timing. Um, all of this was happening in 2002, early 2003. Now, during the summer and the fall of 2002, there was a great deal of fear among U.S. intelligence sources that al-Qaeda was going to make an anniversary, a first anniversary of 9-11 attack again. And the pressure to get actionable intelligence was fierce. Uh, Richard Myers, who's a general who's the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, recalls that in his 40 years of military service, he had never seen the kind of stress and panic at the highest levels of the Pentagon that he saw during that period of 2002. Now, they had a couple of uh, top you know, top al-Qaeda people. It turns out, as another revelation this past week, was the first one they caught it was a mistake that he, to think that he was even in al-Qaeda. Uh, it, it now appears that he wasn't. He was a guy named Abu Zubaydah, but he was a genuine jihadist. They had him. Without torture, he revealed a number of names. But what they wanted was plans and plots, and he wasn't talking about them. It's pretty clear now that the reason he wasn't talking about them was that he didn't know about them. His role was more or less he was al-Qaeda's travel agent. That is, he was the guy who booked hotel rooms and planes for various jihadists, but he didn't know anything about plots. But after he was tortured, he came up with plot after plot after plot after plot. And the authorities were dispatched, were jihadists really going to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge, send squads of police to the Brooklyn Bridge? It's now estimated that millions and millions of dollars were spent sending the authorities to trace down these completely fictitious plots that Abu Zubaydah was revealing, and he was revealing them because he knew that that's what his interrogators wanted, and they were torturing him. So that's... That's what was going on. Now, if you want to do this, and the evidence now, I'll come to this late, uh, in a few minutes, is that the pressure was not coming from interrogators. Uh, the pressure was being applied to interrogators, and it was coming from upper-level officials, mostly in the Pentagon. Um, one of the things that they quickly realized, that if you're going to do this stuff, you need lawyers, and you need legal opinions. Now, why is that? Let me just quickly give you the legal framework that governs the treatment of detainees and interrogation. I mean, there are just a few headlines about it. One is that uh, we are parties to the Geneva Conventions, and the third Geneva Convention is about the treatment of prisoners of war. And uh, among the other prohibitions, it says you can't torture them. You can't commit outrages against personal dignity, including humiliation and cruel treatment. And the United States has enacted a war crime statute that says it's a federal felony to violate those portions of the Geneva Convention. So this is in the Federal Criminal Code, and it's a 20-year sentence. Um, it can be a death penalty if the person dies. So you've got a felony, and it looks as though you're asking interrogators to commit this felony. Um, second, in the late 1980s, the United States joined with 140 other states in ratifying the Convention Against Torture. It's an international anti-torture treaty. And uh, one of the things that it requires states to do is to pass a domestic law, if they don't have one already, that makes torture a crime. And the U.S. did that, and it passed a pair of anti-torture statutes. These, two are felony statutes in the Federal Criminal Code, carrying 20-year sentence, possible death penalty, if the torture victim dies. Now, uh, both the treaty and, uh, and the U.S. statutes have a definition of torture. The wording is slightly different between the treaty and the statutes, but the core of the definition is pretty straightforward. What is torture? Torture is uh, the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical pain or suffering. So that's the mantra. Mental or physical pain or suffering. It's got to be severe. Uh, there's also uh, a category in the treaty called cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment that falls short of torture. So something like you know, humiliating me by stripping me naked in front of U.S. service women and you know, putting a thong on my head is not 
torture, but it would be cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment that falls short of torture. That's not a federal crime. Okay. It's prohibited, but it's not criminalized. But the key is that the infliction of severe mental or physical pain or suffering is a federal felony. So somehow, before you ask interrogators to do that, you need lawyers. And uh, who did they turn to? Um, they turned to uh, the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department. Now, this is until all of this began coming out in 2004, the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department was probably the most important unit of the Justice Department that you never heard of. Um, it's an elite unit. It's got about 20 to 24 lawyers in it, and it provides legal advice to the entire executive branch of government. It's got very distinguished alumni. Justice Scalia headed the Office of Legal Counsel at one time. Uh, uh, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist headed the Office of Legal Counsel. And these are some of the best minds in the United States. Opinions that come out of the law, Office of Legal Counsel are binding. There's a, a dispute. A little, it's a little bit unsettled whether they're binding as a matter of law or binding as a matter of tradition on the entire executive branch. And that gives them an enormous amount of legal authority. It's roughly, you know, for those of you who are you know, the, the law students here, um, roughly the authority of an appellate opinion by the DC Court of Appeals, where most cases involving the executive branch are litigated. The kicker is, first of all, that there's no adversarial hearing in the Office of Legal Counsel. It's just the lawyers writing an opinion letter or a memo, and that's going to be one of the key ethical points that I want to focus on when we try to analyze this rather strange and terrible story that I'm telling you now. Um, the second is that not all Office of Legal Counsel opinions are ever published, even opinions that are purely on matters of law without any secret facts in them, and in fact the torture opinions were secret. So one very anomalous thing, it's a very strange thing, is uh, that we actually have a unit of the Justice Department uh, that writes federal law binding on the executive branch in a non-adversarial way without hearings in secret. And the law remains secret. And as you, you know, those of you who have been following the story know, um, the Obama administration has been releasing some of these memos a little bit at a time. And there's still some that haven't been released. And it's under intense debate right now whether they will be released or not. Uh, now, the, the first step for the Office of Legal Counsel was to deal with the Geneva Conventions, and a, a lawyer in the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, an extremely capable law professor from UCAL Berkeley and, um, named John Yu, uh, tackled that and wrote a memo saying that none of the Geneva Conventions cover the uh, Al-Qaeda or the Taliban detainees. And there were a number of rather technical reasons, uh, some of them were arguable points of law. Some of them were very strange. So for example, he said, Taliban, they look, we're fighting a war with them. Their government looks like their captives are POWs. And he said, well, not really. Afghanistan is no longer a state. Uh, and at that point, uh, Will Taft, who was the Department of State chief legal advisor, went completely ballistic and said, if they're not a state, they don't have to abide by any treaty that they've ever signed on to. And there is no authority anywhere in international law saying that just because you have a collapsing government, you're not a state any longer. So there were a few odd things in this memo, but the president accepted um, the conclusions, and in February of 2002, he announced that the Geneva, he's accepted that the Geneva Conventions don't cover um, the uh, Al-Qaeda or Taliban detainees. So the first of the two pillars of legal protection, the Geneva Conventions, collapse. If the Geneva Conventions don't apply, the federal criminal statute that says that violating the Geneva Conventions also doesn't apply. But that still leaves the torture statute and on August 1st, 2002, John Yu wrote another memo. It went out over the signature of a different lawyer, Jay Bybee, who's now a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But uh, uh, it was uh, Mr. Yu who actually wrote the memo. And this is maybe the most famous of, uh, of all of the dozens of memoranda coming out of OLC at that time. It's a, it's, people just call it the torture memo. And what it did was to analyze the torture statutes in a way that provided the maximum possible cover 
to interrogators for torture. So one of the things that it did was to say this word severe is very vague. What does it actually mean? And he concluded that it's not severe unless it's pain equivalent to organ failure or death. So almost nothing counts as severe, and therefore almost nothing counts as torture. Um, in a moment, I'll tell you how he got to that conclusion, because it's one of the uh, odd features about the torture memo. Secondly, how about mental suffering? He concluded that, uh, that um, no form of treatment amounts to the severe infliction of mental pain or suffering unless the interrogator specifically intended it to last for months or years after the interrogation had ended. Now, of course, no interrogator intends that. They intend for it to be severe at the time they're doing it until the person talks, but they don't say, hmm, I am going to go in and mess with this guy's head in a way that he still has depression flashbacks and PTSD years later. That doesn't happen, so none of that is torture. Uh, Third, uh, the torture memo argues that the president, in his capacity as commander-in-chief, has the power to override any, any statute in the federal statute book, including criminal statutes. So as the commander-in-chief, the president could, under this theory, order a hit against you, not John you, but Y-O-U, a hit against you, and it wouldn't be a crime because uh, um, of the commander-in-chief override. And this was, uh, this was a, an extraordinary theory of constitutional law. Uh, and then the last thing that he did was to talk about possible criminal defenses in case, uh, in case an interrogator were ever, uh, ever arrested and charged with torture. And he said the necessity defense in criminal law would cover this. And also, you could regard it as a form of self-defense. Uh, now, one of the things that was interesting about this, it, this was secret. Abu Ghraib happens in April 2004, and a few weeks later, the torture memo is leaked, and immediately the Justice Department begins backpedaling. The then Attorney General gets up and says, this was a textbook, theoretical, academic exercise. We don't actually think that this binds anybody. And uh, what, uh, unbeknownst to anyone, this memo had already been withdrawn by the Office of Legal Counsel. J. Bybee left for the Ninth Circuit, and another highly conservative lawyer, a co-author of John Yu, and a friend of John Yu took over. This is uh, Jack Goldsmith, who's now a professor at Harvard Law School, and he read through the Yu memos and basically said, OMG, <laughs> and sent a letter sent a letter to the Defense Department that came out years later saying, um, you cannot rely on this stuff. Uh, in his memoirs, Jack Goldsmith describes this memo as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, and he also says, and let me quote his words, he says, uh, its conclusion has no foundation in prior OLC opinions or in judicial decisions or in any other source of law. Okay, so he concludes that it's all uh, completely erroneous. Now, what's erroneous about it? I've told you the conclusions, and they're extreme, but it's not conclusions. It's about 50 pages of dense legal analysis. Um, what bothered people? Well, first of all, there's this definition of severe pain as uh, uh, pain equivalent to organ failure or death. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from a Medicare statute. Okay, there's a Medicare statute that says that you get a free trip to the emergency room in a medical emergency. What are the symptoms of a medical emergency? Well, a medical emergency is something that could be threatening uh, your health in a serious way, organ failure or death. And one of the symptoms that entitles you to go to the ER is severe pain. So he takes a definition of medical emergency that's a quite common sense statement that severe pain can be a sign of organ failure or death impending, and switches it around and says it's not severe pain unless it's organ failure or death. So when a year later the OLC officially 
withdraws this memo and substitutes another memo. The new memo, which was uh, written by uh, another OLC lawyer named Daniel Levin, says uh, this is completely wrong. Uh, this is a definition of a medical emergency, not severe pain. And it's pretty clear what was done in the torture memo. If you do an electronic search on the entire U.S. code for the word severe pain, you only find it appearing in two classes of statutes the torture statute and everything that refers to it, and the Medicare statute and everything that refers to that. So the opinion says, uh, we'll take, you have to read the, the entire federal code as if words have the same meaning in each place. So the definition of severe pain as a medical emergency becomes the definition of torture. And everybody thought that was really weird. Uh, there was one writer who described it less as less textual interpretation uh, than textual inter interpretation run amok like the, word, the work of a bizarre literary deconstructionist. Uh, and I've already read you Jack Goldsmith's uh, um, No Foundation in Any Source of Law. Now, what else? Well, in the, the part about self-defense, he says there is one legal authority, or he says legal authorities, that say that national defense using torture can count as a form of self-defense. And cites a law review article. If you actually look at the page cited, the author says it can't be used as self-defense. So it's just a little bit of, uh, we'll leave off that word not, and quote, and cite to the text. Um, third, there was uh, this commander-in-chief override argument. One of the things that you learn in, in your ethics course is that if you're writing a brief, you're required to cite adverse authority. And uh, it's an ethics violation if you don't cite adverse authority. Here there was an adverse authority. It's the most famous case on presidential power, Youngstown Sheet and Tube. Those who have you've taken con law know that it puts limits on what the president can do as a commander in chief. And uh, the torture memo never cites that. And finally, uh, the necessity defense in criminal law, 18 months before, the Supreme Court had decided uh, the medical marijuana case, uh, Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, and had said, we seriously doubt whether there is a necessity defense in federal criminal law unless a statute actually specifies it. Now, you would think that a lawyer should be citing that even to distinguish away, but the torture memo doesn't cite that. So those were the reasons that the torture memo became so notorious as a piece of uh, bad legal analysis. Now, let's see what happened in the aftermath. In October, there was a meeting of lawyers and intelligence interrogators at Guantanamo. Ordinarily, conversations between lawyers and clients are confidential, but it turned out that there were minutes of the meeting, and last summer, uh, the, a Senate committee released the minutes, and we hear the conversation about this. So what we find, for example, is a key point where a lawyer for the CIA briefing, uh, reading in interrogators, tries to explain the law against torture, and here's what he says. Torture has been prohibited under international law, but the language of the statutes is written vaguely. Severe mental and physical pain is prohibited. The mental part is explained as poorly as the physical. Pause for a moment. I think that's a pretty accurate description of the torture statute, and he's clearly right that the word severe is vague. Okay? Um, that's fair. He, he continues, severe physical pain is described as anything causing permanent physical damage to major organs or body parts. Mental torture is described as anything leading to permanent profound damage to the senses or personality. Pause again. It's clear he's read the torture memo because he is paraphrasing the torture memo in both of those parts. Um, and now he adds his own gloss. It is basically subject to perception. If the detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Now, think about that for a moment. Um, the torture memo doesn't say that, but it says unless its pain is intense as organ failure or death, it's not torture. Well, how do you tell if you are trying to get chalk on the spikes, which was something that the head of the CIA said he intended to do legally. Um, if you're trying to get chalk on the spikes, well, you know you're over the line when the detainee dies. Okay. Later, he's asked about waterboarding. He says, if a well-trained individual is used to perform this technique, it can feel like you're drowning. 
The lymphatic system will react as if you're suffocating, but your body will not cease to function. And he says it's very effective instead to identify phobias and use them. For instance, insects, snakes, claustrophobia. An interrogator asks about uh, imminent threats of death, and he says, well, mock executions don't work as well as friendly approaches, like letting someone write a letter home or providing them with an extra book. Uh, now, I mean, this is a little weird, but I do want you to notice that this is no longer legal advice. This is advice on how to do an effective interrogation. Um, and at that point, one of the officers pipes up and says, I like the part about ambient noise. Um, which is referring to the 24 hours a day of ACDC and Lil' Kim. Um, now, um, this, is, this is amazing. So one of the other lawyers was a JAG named uh, Diane Beaver, who herself wrote one of the torture memos that I think is extremely legally sketchy. Um, afterwards, her memo was released. She is rather bitter about this. She thinks that she was made the fall person in the wake of Abu Ghraib. And uh, in a, an interview, she was describing this scene around the table. She said, then all these young boy interrogators um, started dreaming up ideas and uh, getting, and then she used a word that starts with H and is a synonym for erections. Uh, so she thought that the, the result of this legal briefing was, oh, wow, look what we can do. And uh, ideas have consequences. Um, these were the consequences of the torture memo. Uh, now, I've singled out John Yu in the torture memo, but as I mentioned, there are a lot of these memos and a lot of lawyers involved. Um, Daniel Levin, who wrote the substitute memo, it has some parts in it that I think are extremely sketchy. He, at least, was a deeply principled guy who, weirdly enough, had himself waterboarded before he wrote his memo just to see what it was like. Um, Stephen Bradbury, who eventually took over the OLC, wrote three more torture memos saying that no technique that the U.S. government has ever used, either singly or in combination, is torture or cruel treatment as understood in the law. Those memos have not yet been released. Jack Goldsmith himself wrote a memo on moving uh, detainees out of Iraq to Afghanistan for interrogation that I think is extremely legally questionable, but the kicker is that what we now know from an ABC News report is that the entire upper leadership of the United States government had been read into this. Uh, the interrogation plans, including detailed discussions of all the techniques that were being used, were approved at what was called the principles meeting, which happened every couple of weeks during this period. And at the principles meeting were Vice President Cheney, Secretary Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, George Tenet, the head of the CIA, John Ashcroft, the Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez, who was then the White House Counsel. And this kept going until John Ashcroft at one point said, maybe we shouldn't be talking about this in the White House. Uh, the next day, after this news story came out, President Bush got up and, uh, at a news conference and said, yeah, I knew about the principals' meetings. I wasn't there, but I approved of it all. So this is all... Uh, a client that is the top part of the U.S. government. Now let's step back from this story and ask about the ethics of what the lawyers do. Um, essentially, they provided a client with a legal opinion saying that the client could do what the clients very much wanted to do. What's wrong with that? That's the question. Um, now, we all know that the lawyer's role in the adversary system is to represent clients zealously okay, within the bounds of the law. And if, uh, if there are arguments on both sides of the law, then you push, when you're advocating for a client, you push the law not to the point of frivolity, but to any colorable interpretation of the law uh, that will benefit your client. And we're deeply steeped in that tradition of zealous advocacy. But notice that the, uh, this presupposes a genuine adversary setting. The reason that lawyers can be allowed to push that far in making legal arguments is that there's somebody on the other side who will be counteracting them. So if the argument goes too far or if it doesn't work, if it's a bad argument, then the advocate on the other side is supposed to push back and there's an impartial 
decision maker. Now, things are entirely different when you move from the advocate's role in the adversary system and the ethical duties about making strong arguments of law to the, uh, the situation where you are advising a client confidentially one-on-one. -on -one. Here, there's nobody making the argument on the other side. The client is presumably not a lawyer. And not being a lawyer, the client doesn't know whether the argument that you're making is way out there, uh, whether it's a decent legal argument, anything like that. Okay? And there's no, nobody on the other side, no impartial decision maker, and in many cases, nobody's ever going to find out because the conversation is completely confidential. Now, that changes the lawyer's ethical obligations. Now, the old code of professional responsibility, which preceded the model rules of professional conduct, describes it this way. This is from uh, one of the ethical considerations. Uh, and it says, while serving as advocate, a lawyer should resolve in favor of his client doubts as to the bounds of the law. In serving a client as advisor, a lawyer should give his professional opinion without resolving those doubts necessarily on behalf of the client. The current rule, this is in the, uh, Model Rule 2.1, one of those that doesn't usually get a whole lot of focus in the first year ethics class uh, or in the ethics class at all, or for that matter in the courts. I have never found a reported case on Model Rule 2.1 is lawyer as advisor and its requirements are simple. You give your client candid and independent legal advice. And the comments say you tell your client the truth about the law, even if the client doesn't want to hear it. Okay? Now, that's what I'm arguing is that that follows from the structure of the adversary system. I think it also follows from one other thing, and that is the justification that we have for lawyer-client confidentiality. I mean, all of you who studied confidentiality know that there's something a little bit anomalous about it, because it means that sometimes you have to keep secret things that will lead to other people being harmed. Why is it that we have a rule that allows lawyers and clients to hide the ball? Well, here there is a standard argument for it, which is that it facilitates client communication. And here's what the model rules comments say. Um, lawyers usually advise the client to refrain from wrongful conduct. Almost without exception, clients come to lawyers in order to determine their rights and what is in the complex of laws and regulations deemed to be legal and correct. From experience, lawyers know that almost all clients follow the advice given and the laws upheld. So the idea is we can justify confidentiality because you are helping clients comply with the law. And that presupposes that when the client says, what's the law? you give them the answer straight up. Now, there's a third role, not advisor, not advocate, and that's the role that it seems to me that the torture lawyers took. And uh, I'm going to call it the lawyer as absolver. Um, and it's not just in this setting that lawyers serve as absolvers. It happens in a corporate setting. If a client comes and says, I want to do this deal and I need an opinion from you that says that it's okay. okay. This happens all the time. But once again, you are not supposed to falsify or stretch or maim or inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering on the law when you are stating it to the client. You can't tell the client, oh, sure, just give me the money. Show me the money and I'll write you the opinion letter. Uh, that's called writing a CYA, a cover your ass memo. Uh, it's what Jack Goldsmith called a get out of jail free card. And that, unfortunately, is uh, what the torture lawyers did. And it seems to me that that is the deep ethical confusion that was involved in what they did. They completely confused a very special piece of the lawyer's role morality. Your job as a courtroom advocate, advocating about questions of law. You make the strongest argument that the text can support, and then some maybe, uh, on your client's behalf. And they took that unique ethic and transposed it to a different piece of the lawyer's role. This is the lawyer as advisor. And notice that from the point of view of the lawyer as advisor, you are the law. 
You have a client who says, what's the law? And the client only has one source of information about it, and it's you. If you misrepresent what the law says and the client acts on that, then uh, you've changed the law. I think of lawyer-client conversations as a million little mosaic tiles. You put them all together, that is the law in action at any given time. Now, the fact that the client wants this advice doesn't change it. You can't give it to the client. And so it seems to me that the ethical rule of thumb, if you are advising a client, is my advice has to be more or less the same that it would be if I knew that my client wanted just the opposite. And if you are convinced that some non-standard, weird legal interpretation like the commander-in-chief override is true, you can say that to the client. You can say, you know, this isn't the way that the law has been understood, but I think it's right. But you then have to tell the client, but I'm really in the minority here. I'm a marginal. I've got a marginal fringe creative view, and you should know that before you rely on it. Those are the rules of thumb for ethical advice, and those are what the torture lawyers violated. Now, the last thing before I stop and... Uh, and uh, um, open this up for questions and discussion, is what should be done now? We know that there's this indictment in Spain. I'd, I'd be very surprised if it actually went forward in any kind of serious way. There have been a number of people in the human rights community that are calling for criminal prosecutions in the United States of the torture lawyers. There are some who are calling for ethical grievances, disciplinary action against some of the lawyers. The uh, Office of Professional Responsibility of the Justice Department, which is the ethics unit, and which the head is a, a graduate of this law school, um, has completed a report, um, a four-year investigation on uh, the torture memo and uh, Mr. Yu. Um, it's right now been passed on to the Attorney General, who is apparently trying to take out some of the more inflammatory parts um, because it concludes that this was really unprofessional. And part of the reason is that the new administration really does not want to uh, uh, do what might look like a politically motivated vendetta when it's got a lot of other issues on the platter. So criminal prosecution and discipline are both, in practical terms, not terribly likely to happen. Senator Leahy has proposed a truth commission. Basically, the deal is immunize everybody, no chance of prosecution, but let's at least get this stuff out. Um, this, is, um, I mean, this is a very, very fraught issue. Uh, I think that it would be very difficult to make a disciplinary case or a criminal case. And the reason is, I mean, let's, let's, let's think like defense lawyers for a moment. Suppose you wanted to make a disciplinary case and you look at Model Rule 1.2, which says that a lawyer shall not knowingly counsel or assist a client in illegal action. Is it knowingly? Can you prove that it's knowing if the lawyer has written a memo giving legal arguments that it's not unlawful action? And if that lawyer insists, as John Yu does to this day, that he still believes all the arguments that he put in there. Well, the OPR report might settle that because it's got access to all of the email traffic and early drafts. Until it comes out, we don't know. If it turns out that maybe there were earlier drafts that didn't say this, that would be evidence that it wasn't written in good faith. It was written as a CYA memo. But I think that it would be impossible as a formal matter to make a legal case for treating it as uh, a violation if the lawyer keeps on insisting that I didn't know that this, that this was torture that's illegal. In fact, I was arguing that it wasn't, and I still believe it. How do you prove mens rea? That would be, that would be the question. My own preferred alternative is the Truth Commission because it seems to me that if nothing is done, then this rather, I think, terrifying extension of executive power. I get to override any criminal statute, including felony statutes, because I'm the president, becomes part of our binding precedent, precedent, not president, about what executive power and the separation of powers means. If you do nothing, then you concede to it. If you do nothing, eventually you come to own it. And that's the place that we are right now. So I'd, I'd like to stop at this point and take your comments and questions. Okay.
Well, thank you. Yeah, please. You mentioned the truth commissions being proposed. My understanding was, based on a book I was just recently reading, Susan Kerr Fundament's One Family Search for Justice, that the idea of the truth commissions is to have the victims present. Do the people who propose having truth commissions envision having the victims of torture be present during them? I don't think that's the plan at all. Now, I mean, I think that there, there have been, in various, in various countries that have been post-conflict, there have been truth and reconciliation commissions, which is what Senator Leahy called the thing that he was proposing, in which the idea is that there's an apology from the abuser to the victim. A truth commission is just an investigation. It's, uh, it basically has this deal. We are willing to forego prosecution, give an amnesty, or in U.S. law, it would be to immunize against prosecutions, just because we want to have, we, w we want to know what happened. And there's no idea that there is, that this is the reconciliation model or the victim's model. I mean, I, these are people who are certainly I mean, not going to be apologizing to the victims, and the victims, many of whom have the blood of thousands on their hands, uh, are, I mean, they don't want an apology. They want to go down as martyrs and as holy warriors. I mean, that was the latest that uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, said. So there's no, there's no thought of that. Uh, this would simply be we want to know everything. And, uh, and the reason for doing it, once again, is that if we just say let bygones be bygones, then bygones become our law. Well, thank you very much. So cogent, so clear. Um, I know that in rendering opinions, lawyers engage in debate. I wouldn't call it advocacy, but there was a lot of debate, I imagine, here within justice and with justice and the vice president's office or even the Defense Department of the White House. I wonder if you'd comment on the role of debate in rendering these opinions and, and also on the uh, culpability of people who theoretically supervise all these lawyers and do have authority over them, but, uh, for example, the Attorney General may or may not have done anything other than sign the documents. And I'm not offering, I'm, if you want to take it out of the context of torture, that would be great and put it in law firms or regular Justice Department yeah. activity. Well, um, I don't want to, t uh, let me do that, but first let me leave it in the context of torture. The amazing thing about the torture memos was um, that the lawyers who did it actually did everything in their power to make sure that the debate didn't happen. Um, so one odd thing was uh, it turned out there was bad blood between John Ashcroft and John Yu, and that was because John Ashcroft was uh, out of the loop about what John Yu was doing. Um, the normal process in anything involving military interrogators would be to solicit the input of the military lawyers, the JAG Corps. Um, they were deliberately excluded. And in fact, when they finally found out about the torture memo, basically through the media, all four of the TJAGs, the, the head JAGs and the JAG Corps, wrote letters um, saying, this is terrible. These civilian lawyers obviously don't see things the way that we see things. Um, the Air Force TJAG said, uh, um, we've always taken the moral high road in the U.S. Air Force. Um, they, apparently these guys who are writing these memos don't care what happens to U.S. service members when they get captured. Uh, so they were furious. The secretary, the, the general counsel to the Navy, is a guy named Alberto Mora, was put on a working group on this and was uh, a strong voice against torture, but eventually he was excluded from the knowledge that the working group report had already been issued. And uh, uh, it, it's really an astounding story. And uh, one of the things that happened right after Abu Ghraib was that Congress passed a statute saying, um, we hereby authorize the JAG Corps to give independent legal advice. And when the president signed it, he attached the signing statement saying, that's unconstitutional. 
I think that that's unconstitutional to require JAG independence. I'm the commander in chief. Um, so what we had was a unique episode in which every effort was made to confine decision making to a small echo chamber of like-minded lawyers excluding the experts. Now, what would have happened if the process had been the normal process? If the JAG Corps had come in, they would have said, we've got law about this. We've got a field manual on interrogation that says that you can't do this, and we don't want military interrogators to do it. Very likely that's what would have happened because, I mean, you can't know, but that's what they said in the aftermath. Um, there were some JAGs who went along with it. Lieutenant Colonel Beaver did. Um, I've talked to military officers who said the JAGs at Abu Ghraib must have been knowing what was going on. Where were they at that point? But by and large, the upper levels of the JAG Corps has been extremely zealous in its defense of military honor. And, uh, uh, you know, debate would have been exactly what might have told, you know, might have triggered the view, you know, wh what you're doing is really uh, out there. Okay. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, sir. Thanks very much. I also thought it was terrifically coherent and interesting. Uh, I have a question. Don't you think that it's fair to say that every administration has a kind of uh, one could almost say psychopathology of its appointees, uh, in which, for, for example, many, many years ago when I was a legal intern to Warren Redmond and David Souter in New Hampshire, a Republican administration uh, that hired me as an intern, knowing I was a liberal Democrat. And it was clear whenever I was asked to write a legal memo about uh, that what I was being asked for was not uh, a confirmation, but a legal opinion. Uh, it seemed to me that the Bush administration, for example, from the outset made it clear it was interested not in the truth, but in yes men, in, in, in confirmation of policy. Whereas, for example, the Obama administration has made it rather clear in terms of simply the kinds of people it hired that it was interested more in truth. So do you think that in a certain way an administration is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of these kinds of uh, situations that the Bush admin, that the people who accepted these appointments uh, in, by the very fact of doing so were kind of giving consent to offering those kinds of opinions. Well, I thought you were saying two things. Maybe that, I uh, am. <laughs> one was uh, that there, this was special to the Bush administration, and the second was that anybody who goes into executive branch lawyering drinks the Kool-Aid of executive power. And I do think that that is true. I don't think that the Obama administration, for instance, is giving back any presidential power. Uh, there was, uh, you know, there have been a, little, a few gestures in that direction, but, you know, my guess is that the current president, knowing uh, how much power he's going to have to wield, uh, is going to be very reluctant to ha ask his Office of Legal Counsel to do anything different. There's, a, I think, a, 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 an interesting question about government lawyering, which is, look, if you're writing an opinion for the United States government, it's clear that you're writing a pro-U.S. government opinion. When the State Department legal advisor issues an opinion on whether a war that the U.S. is fighting is legal, I mean, they're not going to come out with an opinion saying we've decided that this is actually completely illegal. Uh, they're writing a, a brief in the court of public opinion. Uh, my view is twofold. First, these secret memos aren't a brief in that sense. Um, they're not for the court of public opinion. They're actually there to paper the file. And second, I'm a little bit unsympathetic to this realpolitik argument. I think if you're writing a brief, call it a brief. If you're writing an opinion, it can't be a brief. If you're taking a brief writer's liberties in stating the law, then you have to say that that's what you're doing and don't say this is a disinterested legal opinion. And I think that you are probably right in the, the broader claim. All executive branch lawyers have a pro-executive tilt, and it doesn't matter which administration. Yeah, uh, sir. Uh, no, you, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor, for coming. Um, my question is, I was interested in this. Uh, there was a Frontline episode several years ago 
after it had all come out and pieces were put together about John Yu and uh, Jack Goldsmith. My question was kind of factual, if you have any um, idea of the perception I got out of it and, and um, investigating it further was that there were several opinions that were written about the idea of enhanced interrogation and the legality of it in the executive branch. And maybe John Hughes was cherry-picked because it fit the mold, maybe the administration's policy preference. And uh, if that is the case, what is your opinion on how to immunize the OLC, which is, you know, they serve at the pleasure of the president of keeping, like you've been saying, legal opinions separate from policy preferences for the administration they work for? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. John Yu has been adamant that he never, ever expressed his policy preferences, that he was only giving legal advice. And, uh, you know, you can take that at face value. You can say that this really is, uh, is, is not, not true. Um, there were several legal opinions. They weren't all written at the same time. So that um, John Yu wrote the first opinion, and there was no other legal opinion at the time. But after his was withdrawn, there was this Levin memorandum that I mentioned that uh, where Levin, you know, this is the guy who actually had himself waterboarded. And it basically, uh, I think, makes the minimum cosmetic changes possible in the U memorandum. So I'm not that sympathetic to it. Um, the issue of the presidential override, it says we don't have to talk about that. Um, the issue of the criminal defenses says unnecessary to talk about those either because this administration has said that it's not going to torture, so we don't need to talk about that. What it didn't say is these are bad legal arguments. Um, it says well, severe pain and suffering it's not, doesn't have to be as excruciating as the U memorandum says. But then uh, what does it say? about severe pain and suffering. It gives a bunch of examples from the case law that are all truly medieval tortures, you know, pulling people's teeth out with pliers and, you know, breaking their legs with baseball bats. Now, if you are a lawyer who is giving a client advice and you give that and the client reads it, what are they going to conclude? Well, I'm not doing that. All I'm doing is keeping this guy awake. So that must not be severe. And finally, there was one piece of it that it seemed to me actually, oddly enough for somebody who had been waterboarded, made up law out of nowhere and legitimized waterboarding. Uh, this was the piece on what's the definition of severe physical suffering, not pain. And the Levin memo says it has to be prolonged. That is nowhere in the statute. Now the fact about waterboarding is that everybody breaks in 30 seconds. Uh, they said uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, holds the world's record of taking two and a half minutes to break. So it's never prolonged, and therefore it's not severe physical suffering. And, you know, so that one is a little sketchy as well. Since then, the Jack Goldsmith's successor, who is a guy named Steve Bradbury, uh, wrote three memos that uh, here they haven't been released yet. Right now I'm told that the Justice Department is in a, engaged in a furious debate with the CIA over whether they should be released, uh, with Justice wanting to release them, and the CIA saying this is going to make us look really bad, and uh, a lot of experienced agents are going to feel like they were hung out to dry. And these were the three memos that said that no technique that the U.S. government has ever used singly or in combination, is torture, and it's not cruel in law. So, so those are probably what you're talking about. The, so we know that there, for, there are at least five torture memos, and there might be more. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Please. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. I, actually, I should have asked somebody on the other side, but I didn't see hands on the other side. <laughs> I very much enjoyed the talk. And the one part that I pause at is when you were talking about the, um, the model rule that might be difficult to, to prove that they knowingly, um, uh, what was it? that they Counsel or assist the client in unlawful, in unlawful action. action. Yeah. And I, I was thinking that if, if it's clearly such has, the, the torture memos really don't have any, any reality in law, which sounds like from your argument and everything I know about it is true, and it's obvious, it's not, it should be obvious to someone after one semester of law school, then 
it seems to me that either the people writing it 